Okay, there we go. One, two, three. There we go. Let's try this again. Okay, so I kind of already talked about that. Um, and then uh, the writing. Okay, so who wants to share? <laughs> I'll not share. Okay. So I'm new to this position. So I didn't know at first, but I found out program, um, I mean, progress reports, mm -hmm. completing progress reports, um, program writing, one on one support for the therapist, um, actually, program modeling and implementation for the therapist. It's the relationship between the caregiver and the company and um, communicating changes and scheduling and schedules mm -hmm. with scheduling. That's good. Some of the things I think. Does anybody else have anything to add that she didn't go over? FBAs. FBAs, what about FBAs? Um, writing FBAs. Um, I think a lot of times the BCBAs are the ones writing the FBAs, but I think when you first start a case, you can definitely go over the FBA with the family and kind of talk about the goals, kind of what things they agree with, what things you guys can kind of target first, prioritize certain goals to start with. Um, but yeah, reviewing the FBA with the team, but also with the family as well. And I think there are uh, some co-soups that are getting closer to taking the exam. Um, Heather is allowing them to write FBAs, but I think it depends how long you've been doing co soup for and how close you are to taking the exam, or if you've already taken it. I have um, a comments kind of question. I think the Heather issue had told me that um, the progress report that the CPA should be doing that. Oh, that's just real. Yeah, I don't know how I was told, I don't, I was told that as well. Okay, yeah. so when, the reason I say that is because I have a case um, from regional center, and so I don't have a BCBA on the case, and so that's the only reason yeah. I have to write it. Yeah, yeah. I was doing them, you just told me that I should do that for BCBA. Yeah, so if you're doing uh, regional cases, then you're the one responsible for the report because there's no BCBA on the regional cases. Um, so you're fully responsible for those. But for any cases that you're co-soup on and there's a BCBA, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we go into the PowerPoint, but um, usually what happens is the co-soup will write the report and then send it to the BCBA on the case. They'll revise it and then highlight areas that you should either add to, revise. I'm so sorry. Um, and then when you submit it, the BCBA signature needs to be on there. Yeah, that's what I was doing. She told me that they should be doing them. Because sometimes, mm -hmm. like, like this month, mm -hmm. I have 12. And you can always reach out to your BCBA on that case and let them know. A lot of my, if it is a month that's like that, if they reach out and say, hey, you know, is it possible for you to kind of jump in and help out, we can always do that. Um, so let, just be in like communication with those BCBAs on those cases and let them know what's going on. Um, there's been times where like I'll start it and then the co soup will finish it or vice versa. So we kind of collaborate on some of those. Um, but just knowing that you will have some part in putting together the progress report. Yeah. But especially on the point. board writing, because you know, you as a supervisor know more about the case than mm -hmm. the BCBA, mm -hmm. because the BCBA goes there only one hour or two hours a month, mm -hmm. so it's no way for the person to get to know the case. So mm -hmm. yeah. we really are the expert in the case, so let's take it out of the therapist. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a working, you know, it's a, it's a teamwork. Mm -hmm. It's the only way. Yeah. And then part of the thing that I will add there is to review the functional behavior assessment, the progress report with the parents. Because mm -hmm. many, many parents, they, they don't know anything about it, and that's right. important, so they understand. Um, um, so I kind of already touched on this, but um, the co suit position is a great opportunity for you to gain experience, to collaborate with BCBAs, and um, obviously grow in the field. And part of that with the um, progress reports is also a good way for the co soups to start learning how to write goals, like you were saying. Um, if they're still kind of in those beginning stages coming into that role, is how do I write a goal? What's the mastery criteria? How do I break it down if I need sub goals? And then that way you can collaborate with the BCBA and say, hey, these were my ideas. What do you think? And collaborate on making sure that it's appropriate as well. Um, okay, so here's a more detailed list of some of the responsibilities that COSUPs have. So management responsibilities of skill acquisition, 
management responsibilities of behavior reduction, creating and monitor behavior support plans. So anytime as a COSUP, if you are creating anything or modifying behaviors, I mean modifying <coughs> behavior plans or modifying goals, revising goals, adding goals or abandoning goals, I would always definitely consult with the BCBA because yeah, you have majority of the hours, so it is truly your case, mm -hmm. um, but it's always just good to have that additional support and ensure that you're making the best clinical decision for the client. So you always want to ensure appropriate communication. So I know um, you talked about schedule changes. Uh, so the, the cases that I have that I'm co-soup on, uh, if there's any cancellation, I always let the BCBA know. Just even if I know they are only coming out once a month, it's just good to know so that they mm -hmm. are aware of how many times either the family is canceling or the therapist is canceling, um, just to keep them on board. Yeah, it helps because if we're only coming out once a month and we're not sure what's happened before then, in order for us to kind of be on the same team and back you guys up, whether it's about the family or therapist or whatever's going on, we need to know kind of what led up to. So for me, a lot of times I have some co that will come and say, this is what's going on, but I never knew about it. Um, so knowing through the process is really helpful because then we can have meetings with the families or the therapists um, and work together as a team to make sure that before we get to that point, we're both on the same page working together. So um, again, I kind of went over this already, design and oversee implementation of support plan with supervisor approval, just to make sure that um, everybody's aware of what's going on, if any changes are being made. Working with the BCBA to develop and coordinate trainings, and then creating any kind of stimuli. So Roni and I share a few cases. So if ever I need to make something and I'm packed with work, she'll help me out and she'll make whatever stimuli we need for whatever case it is, um, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Is it ever okay to assign um, that to a therapist to do? How does that work? They don't have like admin time unless oh, they have okay. a cancellation. Mm -hmm. So if one of your clients, if it's that same client, had a cancellation that day, you can ask the office if they can come in and make stimuli for that specific client. Um, but typically, most of our therapists are out in the field, so they're not in the office. Um, but there are people that do come in, so you can ask the office, hey, I need this me, and then whoever comes in, they can have them make that for you. Um. Um, okay, so then adhere to designated supervision hours and collaborate with BCBA supervisor. So right now, it's 25, the BCBA is responsible for 25% of the supervision hours which means the COSUP is responsible for the remaining 75. However, there are cases where, as a COSUP, you feel you need more support, and then it's you just have to collaborate with the BCBA to split it 50-50 or however mm -hmm. you think is best for the team. Uh, answer any staff or parent questions, email, text, or phone, again, just to ensure that communication and everybody is aware of what's going on. Writing progress reports and create treatment plans. Uh, we kind of already talked about this a little bit, but Again, when you're writing reports, um, you're just you're collaborating the entire time because if the BCBA starts it and then emails it out to the COSUP and you add things, and this is where, I don't know who mentioned it, but the COSUP is usually the one that's more informed about the case because you're out there two times a month at least, two or three. And so in the comment section, if you add comments to your reports, that's where your input is going to be really helpful. And... Um, then you send it back to the BCBA and she'll look at that and if there's any ch changes that are necessary, she'll send it back. So it's all about collaborating to ensure that the report is the best. Uh, conduct team meetings, including parent coaching, modifying behavior plans, IOA, and program maintenance. Uh, I know that for the new therapists, completely new to the field, taking data is one of the most difficult things because a lot of the times they're not doing it correctly. So as a co-soup, always, always take IOA. Um, so if you're only out there twice a month, you should be taking data those two times that you're out there. And usually the way I do it um, is I'll pick, I'll look at the summary sheet and look at the ones that are most inconsistent. So if I see there's no pattern and it's not, it's kind of like 100, 0, 50, 25, 30, I'm like, okay, what's going on? Um, so then those are the goals that I'll target and I'll take IOA on when I'm out there. Uh, represent family at IEP meetings. So usually uh, the BCBA will go out, um, but sometimes the family wants both the BCBA and the COSUP to go out, and that's okay. 
lead and supervise team of therapists, design, collect, analyze, and report client data, collaborate with families, school staff, outside therapists, and the entire ABA team to ensure program consistency. Any questions about any of these? You know, one thing that you can maybe add in there is that even the uh, if the cases that okay, they have, uh, you, 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 we, we are, uh, some cases might, can, be, can be extremely challenging and they have very few supervision hours. They, if you work with the BCBA, you always can ask and do a demo and they can add more hours if it's needed in the supervision. That's something very, very important. Mm -hmm because sometimes you know we have cases that are extremely high challenging right. and they have only like a maybe two hours or three hours left a month mm -hmm. for the uh, sub co supervisor and that's not enough you know and that's where that collaboration is yes. so important um to let everyone know these are the behaviors that i'm seeing this is what parents reporting this is what's going on and then we can kind of discuss and add more hours if needed or figure out what we can do to make sure that we're supporting both the staff and the family appropriately yeah. yeah. And to pick it back off her statement, um, if we do submit an addendum of request, would that be the BCBA's responsibility or would it be the COSIT's responsibility? You can write it up and then always yeah. collaborate with the BCBA. The BCBA okay. will be the one to send it because they put their signature on it. Um, so collaborate with them and let them know what's needed and what the concerns are. And then you guys can write it together. If the COSIT wants to write it and then send it to the BCBA to review, you can do that. So it's very case by case depending on what the addendum is for, um, but always collaborate with the BCBA and find out is there a need for this? Is there another way that we can kind of target this? And if not, it will be both of you guys. Um, if we needed to write an addendum for the FDA, like what's kind of the outline for that? Like if 100% of the goals needed to be changed, then we write it. But like if 50% of them did, that's OK to just keep adding them. Or You're wanting to write an addendum to change 50% yeah, of would, the goals? Would you have to write an addendum if you were going to, let's say that from the FDA, 50% of those goals were mm -hmm. already met? Mm -hmm. um, would you have to write an addendum to like add 50% more new goals? Or would you only have to do that if you had to like change all of them? I would do it if I had to change the whole thing. Okay. Um, if I had to redo the entire FBA, and maybe we need to do a new FBA and reassess again. Um, if it's a portion of it, I would just add those new goals and then make sure in your progress report, same thing, write the goal in the progress report, a baseline of where you started, and then the data that you have up until that point. Okay. Yeah. yeah but at the same time, you don't change that. You made the changes with the progress report. But and if you only you have, like she was saying. Assessment, right. They pay usually only one time. If there's times where if you need to redo it, they'll, yeah. But it has to be clinically, you have to justify why you're going out there. So if it's a case like that where she gets the case and all the goals are mastered, we need to kind of go in there and reassess. But that's something that you would send in the addendum, talk to the insurance company, and then get the extra hours to do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so communication, we kind of talked about this, um, but always communicate with your BCBA supervisor on the case. Um, anything from parent concerns, um, anything about the therapist, if they're not taking data, if they're running things incorrectly. Um, outside providers, a lot of times we collaborate with OT, PT, speech, school staff. So if a parent brings up and says, hey, they're really struggling in their OT session, um, let the BCBA know so you guys can kind of collaborate, come up with a plan on how the best way to collaborate with them, what can we do to help out in those other areas. Um, same thing with school and then any recommendations. If a lot of times we go in there and we kind of see that there might be something else that we can recommend or help out, just communicate that with your BCBA and say, hey, I'm noticing these things. These are some concerns that I have. Um, and then you guys can come up with appropriate recommendations. So for the first session uh, as a COSUP, um, well, before the first session, always read the FBA. Uh, just so you know what you might see um, and get an, a feel for the client and the family dynamic. Um, so clock into shift planning and you start building rapport with parents and with the client. So you go over the FBA with the family. Um, oftentimes when I start a brand new case and I go over the FBA, there are some goals that the family is completely against. Um, for all kinds of reasons. So it's really good to go over the FBA to make sure that they are aware of what you're going to be targeting during session because you don't ever want to introduce a program and then they walk in on your session and you're doing something that they don't want you to be working on. 
Um, sometimes they're just not ready. Some of our little kiddos, when we put in potty training, they might just not be ready to start potty training right away. Um, so letting them know and then briefing with them kind of what it's going to look like, letting them know this is what sessions are going to look like, this is what specific programs are going to look like, this is how we're going to target it so that they understand. And that you have the follow through and consistency from them as well. And then also creating a data sheet and a monthly summary um, for therapists to fill out. And then just going through the binder. Uh, so there are some therapists that are they're just very familiar with the fine binders already because they've been here for enough time, but there are some that are brand new to proof. So you definitely want to go over every part of the binder to make sure that they're filling things out as they should be. Uh, target behaviors and how to track them. And then you review the behavioral support plan if there is one in place already. Uh, if it's a brand new therapist, you obviously want to model and run some of the programs that are difficult um, so that they understand what they should be doing during session. And then just answer any questions and clock out when you're done. Um, so ongoing sessions. So continue, always clock in, clock out, or shift planning whenever you're arriving to session. Um, greet parents, clients, and the therapists. Um, so creating that professional kind of um, environment with them, but still being there to support them. Check in with parents. Um, a lot of times I'll just kind of ask, how's the week been going? Any concerns? Any new behaviors? Um, anything like that. So just kind of checking in with them. Review the binder. So looking at the summary sheets, looking at the data that the therapists have been taking. Is everything kind of up to date? Um, is everything in the binder? Is anything missing that we need to kind of put in? There's the FBA in there. Um, enough data sheets for them. ABC data sheets if they need any of those. Um, Support the therapist with any questions um, that they may have. So they have that first 10, 15 minutes. It's a good time to kind of check in with them as well as they're getting their data sheets prepared for that session um, on how things have been going that week. Uh, model strategies for them. So as they kind of get started with session, um, jump in there and kind of participate, play with them um, instead of just kind of sitting from afar, but get in there with them and kind of help them in any programs that they're struggling with. Um, play and participate, I said. Uh, review goals to see. So looking at the mastery sheet to see, is there anything that's ready to be mastered? Can we move on with anything? Or on the other end, if things aren't moving, are there any modifications that have to be made? Maybe splitting up the targets, not working on as many targets per goal. Um, but looking at why things are not moving, or if things are moving, where do, what's the next step from there? Ensuring that therapists are collecting data, conducting IOA, so making sure that the entire session they're taking data immediately as things are happening. They're not waiting till the end of session, so um, doing that. Creating visuals and stimuli as needed um, and showing them how to use it. A lot of times if you make a visual schedule or um, a PEX system or thing, you can't just hand it over to them, um, depending on the therapist, but sometimes those first few sessions you have to jump in there and show them how to run PEX or how to use the visual schedule. And then every session leaves supervision notes in the binder. Um, what things did, re did you review with them? What things did you model? Is there any changes in data taking? Um, new targets that you've added to certain programs? So keep that in the binder so the next therapist coming in knows what you guys reviewed. Also when the BCBA comes in, they know exactly what you've reviewed with them as well. Okay, and then boundaries. So it's extremely, extremely important to always maintain appropriate boundaries with families. And this can become really difficult uh, because you are in their home often. And it becomes even more difficult for therapists because they're in the home more often than supervisors are. But you always want to maintain those boundaries. And a lot of the times parents will want to vent to you and they trust you, you're always there, they see you. Um, but again, always redirect the conversation back to the client um, and only talk about things that pertain to the client. Okay, should we pass it up first? Oh, yeah. um, so we just started creating um, position packets. So every position, and there's some behind us as well for other positions, but we're going to start passing these out. Um, but everything in here, this is our COSU packet. Um, so everything in here should be data sheets that you need to use, a lot of the things that we kind of reviewed, responsibilities. Um, so you guys can have this to look at and kind of go back um, today because I, I think it's already kind of full. But, um, okay, but let's, I want to talk about um, one of the responsibilities that we didn't list on the PowerPoint, but write ups. Um, so there's a piece of paper with the therapist's competencies. 
on there. It looks like this. So when you guys are out at session, fill out these competencies for them so that way we can file it in their files so we have kind of a running way to see their progress, how they're doing. Um, and there's a lot on there. There's admin, professional, and clinical. So in all areas, we can kind of see how each therapist is doing. Um, and then from this, if you get to the point where you do need to write up a therapist, there is a write-up form as well. Um, that you, and then in the packet, there's the disciplinary action form. And that kind of talks you through the steps of what you would do if you needed to write them up. <coughs> right. <laughs> okay. So um, I guess we'll talk about PC really quickly. Yes. Since it came so up. we'll have you ask your question, and then we can kind of see. Okay. So my question was, what's the relationship between like the PC and the supervisor? Because in some cases, I've been on. The supervisor and I really don't communicate that much, and then I've been on cases where the supervisor has given me goals mm -hmm. to work on with the parent, which I'm okay with both, but I just want to make, make sure I'm And there is the a PC on the case mm -hmm. for those ones? Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say I'm the PC, and then some cases I come in, the, the supervisor's like, oh, these are the goals I want you to run, work with mama. Uh -huh. And then some cases, the, the PC, which I'm the PC and supervisor, we don't really see each other. Right. We don't really talk. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a concern or something, I may text them, but we don't really have any communication. Yeah. So I just didn't know, is it supposed to be like a line of communication where you're following the goals that the supervisor mm -hmm. wants you to follow? Or do you go through the manual? Because I just go through the manual. Through the manual, but also the parent goals that are identified in the FDA. Yeah. Okay. Um, so going over those goals, because those come progress report time, we're going to need data for. So start working on those goals as well. But I would say communicate with your PCs and PC data as much as possible. Uh, if I don't hear from my co supervisors or PCs, I will reach out and just like, hey, how are things going? You know, any concerns? Are you working on certain goals? Um, so I would definitely communicate as much as you can, even if it's just via email or a quick text, um, just to kind of let them know how things have been going. I would continue that. Yes, I don't know if that answered. You did. Thank you. And then for PC also, um, I know there's been. I guess uh, different information relayed about it, but you have to take data for PC. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. So a lot of uh, PCs don't take data because they have been told they don't have to or because they just don't. <laughs> but you have to because yeah. when you submit the progress report, there are parent goals and the insurance wants to know how the parent is doing. So mm -hmm. if you don't have anything to show, you have to have a pretty good justification for why there hasn't been any data tracked for six months. And um, that's where, as a COSU, that communication is going to be beneficial mm -hmm. because six months goes by really fast. And all of a sudden, you're sitting down to write the report, and you reach out to your PC, hey, send me the data. And they said, oh, I don't have any data. I haven't been taking it. It's on you then to kind of justify why that is in the report. Um, so that communication with them on a regular basis lets them know so you can kind of catch that early and let them know you have to take data. So come six months, progress report, you have things to input into those goals. Yeah. And then I think another thing also to think about when you're doing PC, because you are working directly with the parent, again, maintaining those boundaries, um, and then also maintaining your role as only the PC for the case. So a lot of the times, again, these parents are giving you a lot of information, personal information, so you never want to fall into a role of MFT or supervisor where you're suggesting different things and suggesting changes to programs um, when that's not really your role. Mm -hmm. So you want to be really, really careful to not do that. Oh, I just had a comment, um, what you guys were saying about the PCs taking data, also to leave all data and notes in the binder. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a lot of, well, not a lot, but a couple of PCs who will take it home with them, and then I go out for supervision, and I have no idea what they've been working on or anything. And following HIPAA confidentiality stuff, everything should stay in the binder. Yeah. If you're transporting information back and forth, we don't know if it's going to fall out of your car, if somebody else comes in and sees the client's name all over it. Um, so everything should stay in the home. Everything should stay confidential. Um, so yes. I think that was a misunderstanding, and now since I'm getting better in that regard, because I think that they, what, what, what people misunderstood maybe is that the raw data should be submitted every day of the month, and that's, you know, where they were 
talking about it, and that's what many people did. You know what I mean? You put in the raw data and you put it on the on the on the binder, supervision binder. So that's pretty much what was happening. But now we know that we have to leave that at least the monthly data. You know what I mean? Just take a picture and send it to the uh, to the person in, in charge. But let me ask something about the PC. Because I think that is very important, um, and I know because of the so many years doing this, the PC work is something like Anna was saying. That's really very key, important role. Mm -hmm. Role is one maybe one of the most important role in all the whole, because the main goal that regional center have for medical has is that the parents become the future therapists for the kids. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful because sometimes parents see therapists as a babysitter or like a way to you know escape. No, they can't do that. They have to really follow and they have to learn how to implement the techniques and the whole dynamic and that's very very important so the data tracking is important because some cases might be and you know because we have been working on cases like that can be really high challenging cases and what we protect us for any legal action or anything is that the data that we are taking and we prove that it's happening and so parents, that's a very important role. yeah and parents are aware that they have to participate 25 percent of session because that's in the contract mm -hmm. so when they sign the contract they're aware um of of that like they know they have to participate so that again if you are going into observe a session and you realize or you see that the therapist is left alone with the child and parent is upstairs or asleep or you know because we've seen it all um that you have that conversation with parents so that they are participating the parent is unwilling to participate let the BCBA know, yeah. <laughs> so you guys can have that conversation. Also, that the BCBA can be there to support you as well, um, but that you have a meeting with that family. And the BCBA already knows they've had that meeting with the family. He's still unwilling. Okay, then I would go back to insurance. Let yeah, Heather insurance. know and go back to insurance because he doesn't want services, but mom does. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's true. Contact insurance because yeah. insurance then will contact the family and then they yeah. can let them know kind of what's going on. Let the insurance know all the dynamics of what's going on, um, but they have to participate. They have to be in session. Yeah. Because a lot of the times what happens, because I've had families like that where they just refuse, like they think well, the that they don't need it. The advocate for the services, but dad wants nothing to do. Yeah. So a lot of the times um, I've had to have that conversation after contacting the insurance and exhausting all other resources where it's like okay this is what it is you get one-on-one -on -one and you have to get parent consultation if you don't want parent consultation you don't get services and then most of the time that's kind of the deal breaker and they're like okay fine well the and ECBA suggested at this point that the mom just take full custody because there's no other route to take mm -hmm. as uh, other than just taking legal action just taking full custody yeah. And see, again, that's where it gets tricky because it goes back to the issue of boundaries. Right. Um, and it's not our place to, no, yeah, to, to recommend. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so again, always redirect the conversation to the client and what is, so I would just say, okay, insurance requires that parents be involved in 25% of sessions. So mm -hmm. if you refuse, then this is what's going to happen. And you can put that into your progress report as a barrier yeah. and explain why there hasn't been consistency, why uh, goals haven't been moving forward and making the child not making progress. The barriers are, and you can list that and kind of give them a little quick information as to what's going on. Um, but yeah, I would contact Heather and contact the insurance um, and let them know. They, they will kind of figure it out. They may come back and say, no services. They may come back and say, okay, well, services are with mom, and that's only the data that you have, um, but they'll kind of help you from there. I have a question. For clients who only receive services here at the office, should we be involving the parents in session here, or should we push for like at least one home session? I would or do either. Both. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. yeah, because if you're only doing it in clinic, uh, right. once they go home, then you miss that generalization, that consistency of, and they don't know what to do either. So the child comes home and he's tantruming and they're just standing there not knowing what to do. So if they at least can observe you in session in clinic and know how to handle it, yeah. Um, so I would do both. Yeah, I have one question too. In terms of like progress reports, um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes there's some progress reports that take longer than two hours. I've had that multiple times, but I only bill two hours because I can only bill two hours. 
Is there some instances where, like, if it's a long, tedious progress report where we can actually say, look, we actually spent this much time. It took me longer than the usual. Mm -hmm. Can I bill for more? You can reach out to Heather. If she approves it, then yes. Reach out and let her know why it's taking longer and kind of what the situation is. Um, and then she would have to approve those extra hours for you. And then something that I've, because I was running into that problem and still often do, but yeah. what I do is I always bring my laptop with me and every time I'm out there, I just update the report so that when I do have to submit it, I don't have to do a ton of extra work. Yeah. yeah. It's maybe just a month and then comments, recommendations, and summary. That's what I do. Yeah. Just I that come progress report, session. you only have that last month to yeah. input yeah. and your comments. And that makes it a lot quicker. Yeah. And then when you have multiple, like five or six a week, it's just, yes. you know. So. But one thing that would be, that can be very helpful is that the, the company can let us know no, no, a month and a half, a, a month in advance, but even at the beginning of the mm -hmm. case when they report to. Well, now, so now they're, they're putting, putting it on there. there. Yeah, yeah, it's on there now. When you're getting new clients, yeah. it's on there. It should be on there. Yeah. Okay. When you get new clients at the very bottom, yeah, it will tell bottom. you mm -hmm. the authorization yeah, period, yeah. and then the reports always do three weeks yeah. before. So I have okay. no idea what it is. Yeah. 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 I know the older ones yeah. don't yeah. have them, but the newer ones. It's so on the email. We hope we can talk on email instantly. so they can give us the it's day when they are. Well, I always look at my FBAs and my progress reports, and then it will so tell you, you know, zero. by so April or by May, and then I know, nine. yeah. Okay. So what would you do first? Um, go over goals and see where client um, is at and show what areas client has progressed. So go over with um, the parents mm -hmm. where the client is at and see, just kind of show them, okay, work. Progressing in this area, but you know, just, and just explain how the programs work too for each. Because sometimes mm -hmm. parents may not have any idea mm -hmm. as to why we're doing the goals. Explaining mm -hmm. each one of them, um, and then we also went on to say that um, you know, explain that behaviors typically, if it's a brand new case, that typically behaviors will be support decline. So you're going to see a lot of you know, challenges, and it's going to be tough. And um, and once again, explain APA and also collaborate with the PC to make sure that the you know the person who's doing PC is explaining that APA is all about as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I also input um, narrowing down with the parents what areas they don't see in progress mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes you know as ABA providers we see progress, mm -hmm. um, but as um, parents' expectations are completely different than ours. So and you know. So for that, we have to, you know, take the time and explain that progress takes time and it's not going to be as quickly as they would like for it to be. Mm -hmm. So giving them like realistic time goals of what they will see. Um, and then collaborate with the, um, as far as who and why, who and how would you collaborate? Just collaborate with the BCBA and PCs. Make sure that we're all on the same page and you know, give your therapist the support that they may need mm -hmm. and just observe how they're implementing the programs and just kind of figuring out how can we make this you know, goal. If it's not working, then how can we make it um, We need to collaborate with the therapist. This is very, very, very important mm -hmm. because the therapist knows the kids much better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, what I do basically on monthly basis, I tell the therapist, you know, can you write down the accomplishment? Can you write down what you see that we don't see? Can you write down the language I pass me? And, I, I, they, and then they write down, I see this, and that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like to like tell my therapist during their sessions is to get really excited when the kids are doing good and call the parents in and just be like, oh my God, chocolate dip this, come and watch. And you know, doing that will get the parents excited. Like, oh my gosh, she never did that. Did she ever do that before? No. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. So it gets them motivated and excited like, oh, she's actually doing something. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that you can kind of jump in there and kind of model for them because a lot of times they're kind of focused on I have to take data, I got to get through these goals, now there's a behavior, I got to track this. So they're so focused on that stuff. So it's nice for someone to kind of jump in there like, oh, I can do some of that as well um, to show them that. And then for the collaboration, um, how you collaborate. So this kind of goes back to one of the responsibilities we talked about and setting up meetings, team meetings. So there are 
cases that are a little more difficult than others. So it is your responsibility as a co-soup that if you think it's necessary to get the entire team together, that you do that. Um, and that will include usually parents, the PC, therapist, um, BCBA, if there's a BCBA on the case. Yeah, one of the problems that people are facing with that is the hours per center. Mm -hmm. So what I usually do, uh, we constantly communicating, you know, testing or something or email, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, we say, okay, this month is planned meeting, you know, I mean, or team meeting. Mm -hmm. So the BCBA take the hours, you know, for, for that they have for that mm -hmm. meeting yeah. and, and that will help a lot. Because that's sometimes the constraint that we have. Yeah, it does take away from their yeah. hours. Yeah. yeah. And that's obviously something you would want to communicate with the families to make sure that they're okay with that. Do they need approval for that? Is there like a, a step to get like a meeting? I mean, we've phone? done it where it's in session. And so the therapists are billing their one on one, we're billing supervision, and the PC is there billing their PC. But it takes away from those hours. And that's what Anna was saying communicate that with your families. We have a case where we spot, we talk to mom and let her know if we have this meeting through the week it is going to take two hours away from the one-on-one -on -one. so they have to kind of understand that we can't go over hours um, so we use it within the hours that we have so what if you have two therapists and they're on different days and you want the whole team to be there so how yeah. what would be the perfect for that it's the same thing. Okay. So it's both therapists, would, from but the, it takes away. Yeah. yeah. So that's why you want to, and sometimes parents have a really difficult time understanding that part. So just make sure, and what we do is we usually say, okay, for this week, instead of having 10 hours, she's going to have six hours because mm -hmm. both therapists will be there. And for the entire month, now she only has two hours of PC and four. So it's because it does take away from the hours. So you just want to make sure that the parents are okay with that. If it's a case where for some reason that week you had a lot of cancellations, you have a lot of extra one-on-one -on -one hours, you could use that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we can't go over. Yeah. Um, did anybody want to add about add on to um, any changes that you would make to programs or interventions if you don't see progress? Yeah, I would consider, like I obviously look at the goals first, but I would consider reducing goals. Like maybe there's just too much open and it's too overwhelming for the kiddo. And same with the parent goals. Like one of the issues with not seeing progress could be that when we leave, parents aren't implementing things the way that we are. So when we're not there, they don't see progress. And so the PCs might have just too many parent goals open and it's too overwhelming for the parents to learn everything all at once. So I would take that into consideration as well. And as PC, it is okay to put some goals on hold because some of the PC goals, it's one goal, and within that one goal, there's like six goals. So it's okay to just focus on one part of the goal or just that one goal if there are multiple steps to it, um, and then just justify that when progress report comes. So that one thing that is important too is just to add to that is that. Uh, the, the benchmark. Sometimes when people, when we write functional behavior assessment, I mean, we write a functional behavior assessment in base of two or three observations, but really we don't know the client, you know what I mean? It's just we are, we, we write the goals almost assuming that that's what this, this page, but not necessarily true. When we start the services, is we realize, wow, at the moment, you know, this, this goal is extremely too high for this kid, or the same time is too low for this kid. So we have to work on the benchmark and basically, I will say, I'm going to send some of the, my secret, you know, resources so that will help you. And in the benchmark, you can see that before you can go for five, you need to target one. You cannot target goal five if it, the person doesn't have the prerequisites, you know what I mean? So that part is important and that's what, what, what they were saying that if you adapt the goal according to the child's needs, you know, developmental needs. Can I say you do? I had something I was thinking um, that we discussed it was about the, the importance of rapport with the parent, validating their feelings, their concerns. I'm being on like psychoeducation, actually giving them information to look over um, and to validate like they really trust you to share their information, their concerns with you. Because I've had cases where parents would be upset and not say anything, and then they say, you know, it's like, oh, we cancel services, you know, without the, 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 the line of communication. So I like to, you know, I would validate the, the parent and their concerns and make sure I, you know, contain those feelings with them. So 
I really agree with you. I think if something like this happens, this is a red flag for me being like, my communication has been non-existent if this is happening. This is a big deal when this happens. Um, and my like first, my personal first step for what would I do is I would just listen and I would ask open-ended questions until they cannot think of one more thing to say. Mm -hmm. And then I would not argue, I would just let, you know, I should have data that backs up my claims, but you're right, this isn't going anywhere. This is why I think this is. Thanks for coming to me because you guys caught something mm -hmm. as I caught something. Let's change it together. Or, you know, I understand what you're saying. Maybe I've misunderstood what are your big things that you guys want to work on. Let's talk about that. What are your big things? And that what you know if things change tomorrow with a snap of your fingers what would that thing be if that was what you wanted to change and that's that's a way to get them to at least identify like what's missing with that missing piece and then they're more open to you know speaking and then you know making it collaborative well we, we're collaborating it's not me coming in you know telling you that this is going to work but what do you see you have the most insight about the behaviors in your child and mm -hmm. we're a team and I think when they feel more invested and they're open then I set a goal of hey well can we try this for the next three weeks and then let's revisit it mm -hmm. and so I have something to measure and they feel like they're heard right. and I think that's the most that's one of the most important things for me yeah and then this uh, scenario kind of opens up the topic of generalization too because oftentimes I have cases where the child is doing great during session, but the parents see no progress outside of session. So then that's sometimes why they say this, like, I don't see progress. Um, so then that's where you would want to make changes to your programs to make sure that you are focused on generalization. And the child has those opportunities. Do you want to keep going? Oh, we can. Uh, we had a question from someone who's doing FBAs. Um, so we wanted to kind of quickly just kind of go over some of the stuff that you would kind of do in an FBA if you're conducting it on your own. Um, so we'll kind of go over just the basic and then let us know questions that you guys have. Um, but we have the client service agreement packets in the office. So when you're assigned an FBA to conduct, you would come pick up one of these packets. Everything is in here. Um, so when you go and meet with the family, your first meeting is going to be in the home. The child's there so you can observe them as well. You're going to go through the packet and um, there's reinforcement assessments in here. There's um, authorization for releases and everything. There's certain documents that you do need to have them sign and then when you write the report, and send the report in, you would also attach the scanned signed documents as well. Um, but it goes through services, our sick policy, HIPAA confidentiality, um, their participation in sessions. So everything is in here and they're signing off on understanding what this means and moving forward this is what's going to be implemented. Um, so your first meeting, you typically have two meetings with the family. Your first meeting is going to be kind of going over the documents, um, finding out what are their concerns, what behavioral things are going on that they have difficulties with. Um, talking about, I go everything from like pregnancy and medications, any hospitalizations, allergies, so we can rule out any medical things first. Uh, milestones that they've reached. Um, and then we kind of go into what does your day look like? Where are you struggling? Where are the difficulties? Morning routine, um, school information, um, after school, nighttime, how is their feeding? They're sleeping. Are they sleeping through the night? Um, any issues with feeding? Is that something that we're going to have to target? So really kind of trying to get a rounded picture of what this child looks like. Um, making notes to myself and then as I'm there a lot of times I flip and I start writing goals um, just kind of general stuff that I know okay this is what I want to make sure I target in there um, at that point you can you schedule your second observation um, I typically do a social observation so wanting to see them with peers so at school or at a park or out in the community something like that so I can see one safety concerns but also how do they interact with other kids um, do that observation um, so always get your release of information um, if you're going to go into a school or other therapies make sure that parents give you permission to contact and set that up um, after your second observation then you get the template um, and then you can start writing everything so your observations go in there any background information sometimes parents will give you reports to review so a lot of times I get IEP reports or medical stuff so I just know in there that I've reviewed those as well um, and then write the report um, from there. So having all the goals in mind, sometimes parents will say, I really want to work on this, or this is something of concern, so adding that into your report. And then um, there's an outline in the packet, if you guys go through it, um, for FBAs. So it's in the closest packet. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for like FBAs, like, like LA Care, um, they have some assessments that aren't available in the office. 
So, like, I run into, like, okay, what am I going to do now? Like, we don't have, we don't offer this assessment in the office. Like, mm -hmm. um, like, ABAS, um, that's one. For Maybe LA math. Care, um, the main things that they're wanting is the Violent, which we have, and the VB Map. So those are the two that they're really wanting you to include for those. Um, and we should have both of those here. Okay. I can we, Apple, can we, uh, in order to do that, you have to have some style of certification. You can implement the ABC. That one, you can do it. But I feel that the violin, you have to be psychologist and you have to We be can do the violin. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we have the violin packets here, and we uh, also have the scoring system. Yeah, it's on the computer in there. So for LA okay. Care specifically, which is a little bit different, okay. and their templates <laughs> are different. <laughs> yes, those ones are different. Um, but we do have both the violin and the VB map here, so you can always grab those. Yeah, but those are the two that they're kind of requesting. Anything else that you want to add into that, you can kind of put in there. Yeah. But so I feel like with like the other FBAs, we can just do ABC data and fast. fast. But yeah. with yeah. LA yeah. Care, it's like it's so specific, and they ask you to do so many graphs. It's like yeah. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> yes, it, their templates are very different yeah. than yeah. our regular ones. Mm -hmm. It's a great. Sorry. Does anybody know how to score the violin on this, the software? Because I tried going on it, but it's a little bit different from the one that I'm used to. I can show you, but yeah. you basically just put in the numbers. It's really easy. So you just go into the category, and you start punching in your numbers, and it should just take you to the next well, yeah, section. Well, yeah, when I went, tried to go in again, I was like, this does not look the same. It's not working. I'll have so to look at that, it. You can show me after yeah. that. Yeah. Um, any other questions about FBAs, if you have ran them or you haven't, just knowing if you start getting some of those on where to start, what to do, how to complete it? Any questions? Um, from, I, I'm new to proofs, so I'm not exactly sure how it goes, but what I'm used to is first session, that's when we obtain consent for treatment for the yes. FBA. Mm -hmm. Do we, is that something that happens here, or do they have it pre Yes, and it's in session? the packet. Yeah. It's in the which package? the client service agreement package. So they do it before services have even initiated. It's yes. Primary to the FBA. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So all the documents that you need to have parents sign are in there. So you just kind of go through the packet, have them sign, explain to them what everything means. Um, yes. So same thing. Yeah. Okay. Kind of detour. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Um, when out in the community, client gets out of the car and runs across the street to go into the store. Mom runs after him, yelling for him to come back. Client falls to the floor, crying because he wanted a toy. Mom picks him up and goes into the store. The client then runs away from mom and walks over to a man trying to hide behind him. What goals would you put in place for client and parent? Um, so we'll give you the... <laughs> Okay. Can we just go over like what we would teach the parents? So basically, the parent goal that we would teach is basically learning like pre math before then um, get into the store, just basically like a first then, and then teach the parent like environmental arrangements and holding the child's hand all, at all times around the community. And then the child goes to teach the safety rules, how to follow the child from here and wait, or ask for permission when, or ask for access to an item if you are leaving mm -hmm. or going. Okay. And then um, what behaviors would you track? He won't, he won't be. Okay. Tantrums. And yeah. You want to add? Oh, and tantrums. <laughs> um, anybody else? Did you guys, anybody else have a different goal for parent or for child? We so, talked about adding a, a, a parent goal for implementing like the appropriate consequence. Since it sounds like she's giving you know, attention and exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even prior to that, I would do functions of behavior because it sounds like the mom doesn't understand, like, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be reinforcing that, but she doesn't know the function of the behavior, so I would do that one. I also think that before going out into the community with the client, we should be practicing safety mm -hmm. commands in the home because if this is happening, I mean, that's really unsafe for everybody until we have a better grasp on, you know, his compliance. And Anybody else? No. Priming. Priming. Priming, yeah. Priming, yeah. Priming, yeah. FCT for the child. You know, if you can ask for a toy, mm -hmm. you can't you know, run across the 405 and get one. And then what about, um, I don't think anybody said mentioned anything about this, but what about when he walks over to a man trying to hide behind him? Personal space? Oh, personal yeah. space. Yeah. 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 Stranger. 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 
Yeah, so there's quite a few goals you could yeah. create just for this one incident. Okay. Okay. A uh, session takes place at a park. The client arrives and walks over to the sandbox. There are two other kids playing in that area. One girl looks up and says, do you want to play with us? Client doesn't make any eye contact and walks away to the other side of the sandbox. He finds a shovel and begins to stim on the sand. What goals would you implement? So same thing. We'll give you a couple of minutes <laughs> to share. Pick up. Someone down there? We okay. haven't heard. Okay. okay. Other, uh, eye contact, um, the responding to peers, parallel play, stem. That's pretty yeah. much it. Okay. <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions about anything we talked about? Okay, Sorry. so um, for today, you'll bill for training.